few weeks ago, I asked the question why, if the authorities want to discourage the private ownership of gold, would so many major countries have enacted programs starting in the 1980s to mint bullion coins to be sold to the public? The U.S., in fact, started a program of gold medallion sales in 1978 as a pilot for the bullion coin programs put into law in 1985, which saw the U.S. start minting coins in 1986. In my last video, I spent quite a bit of time discussing President Reagan's Gold Commission of the early 1980s. The Gold Commission was assembled to discuss the international monetary system and the feasibility of going back to a gold standard. The report is available for free for anyone who wants to work their way through it. Ultimately, the Commission opposed the Treasury issue of gold-backed notes and bonds, and also recommended against the re-establishment of a gold standard for the purpose of controlling inflation. They instead recommended the government seek some other way to impose discipline over the growth of debt and currency supply. At the same time, they recommended the government continue its program of medallion sales to start issuing bullion coins with a modest markup sufficient only for covering the cost of making the coins, and maintain a sufficient treasury gold stock to hold as a contingency in the event that the world de uh, decided to reenact some form of gold standard in the future. Let's spend a little time discussing the experience of the U.S. with the use of gold in the last century, what gold essentially did for balancing trade between nations, and how it was ultimately abandoned in official use. I'll sum my thoughts up now with this simple idea. Gold's honesty, as it pertains to balance sheet accounting, far exceeds the capacity of mankind to be honest with one another in financial dealings. Let me, let me repeat that so that it can sink in. Gold's honesty, as it pertains to balance sheet accounting, far exceeds the capacity of mankind to be honest with one another in financial dealings. The failure of the gold standard was not a failure of gold. It was the result in a flaw in human nature. That flaw in human nature is still present, and so there is no reason to expect that a gold standard will work in the future. That's not to say that gold does not have a key role to play, but we'll discuss that later. For now, let's discuss the experience of the U.S. with gold in the last century. In my last video, towards the end, I discussed the Gold Reserve Act of 1934. It was primarily a result of the failure of the banking system, despite the presence of a Federal Reserve for almost 20 years prior, which was supposed to prevent such things. The banking system had essentially overissued claims on gold, which they could not possibly honor, when the people lost confidence in the claims, they started to show up to redeem their gold. The big risk this created was that the first in line would get all of their gold, while those later in line would lose everything. Clearly, not a good situation. The result was the banking holiday which closed the banks, and the transfer of 125 million ounces of gold from the books of the Federal Reserve to the U.S. Treasury. The Treasury then created gold certificates, which it put on the books of the Federal Reserve. And why was all this necessary? Quite frankly, it was because the banks cheated. They thought that having a banking monopoly due to central control would avoid the bank runs which had plagued the system the century before. They issued many more gold claims than they had specie to back it. And when the people got nervous, it threatened the entire financial system. It was not gold that failed. Gold's honesty as it pertains to balance sheet accounting far exceeded the capability of mankind to be honest with one another in financial dealings. And since the government could not tolerate the last people in line bearing the full brunt of the consequences of the moral failings of those who had been in charge of the banking system, they took the control of the gold away from the banking system and placed it in the hands of the treasury. In return, the Federal Reserve was given gold certificates and the mandate to maintain a 35% coverage ratio of gold certificates to Federal Reserve notes. And what happened next? The government cheated as it pertained to international trade. You see, the role of gold as it pertained to balancing international trade was this. Nations held a particular stock of gold to back their currency. There would be times when a particular nation would run a trade deficit meaning it would import more goods in terms of value than it exported. 
What would generally happen was that gold would flow out of a particular country's treasury and into the treasury of the countries running surpluses. As this happened, the countries that lost their gold would see their purchasing power of their currency decline in the international market. This would then tend to increase the price of imported goods and decrease the trade deficit. In other words, it was gold that balanced international trade. That was its role. That was its purpose. But in 1934, Roosevelt devalued the dollar relative to gold, whereas it would take about $20 in currency to purchase an ounce of gold before 1934. It took $35 in currency to buy an ounce of gold afterwards. The effect of this action was to severely change the equation governing international trade. From the U.S. perspective, internationally produced goods became more expensive, and from an international perspective, U.S. goods became quite inexpensive. So the U.S. then started running a large trade surplus in the late 1930s, which was then enhanced by the outbreak of World War II. As a consequence, international gold flowed into the coffers of the U.S. Treasury. But the message to take away here was that the U.S. government cheated. Gold's honesty as it pertains to balance sheet accounting far exceeded the capacity of mankind to be honest with one another in financial dealings. The imbalances that led to the massive accumulation of gold essentially ended when the U.S. entered the war and started spending huge sums of money herself. Then in 1944, the Western world leaders got together in a hotel in New Hampshire and came to an agreement on a new monetary system. The goal was essentially to fix the system of international trade and make things more balanced. The IMF was created, as was the World Bank. A new system was created where the U.S. Treasury, which held so much gold at this point, would be the main keeper of gold. The Federal Reserve Note, which was essentially backed by gold certificates, was to be used as the international reserve currency. More importantly, all nations were to maintain a fixed exchange rate against the U.S. dollar. The role of the IMF was to arrange loans to nations who got into trouble so that they would not be forced into a position where they would devalue their currency. And in theory, this should have worked, but in practice, it didn't. For the next 25 years or so, the world saw many countries devalue their currencies in order to remain competitive. The U.S. saw surpluses turn into deficits, and gold eventually started flowing out of its coffers to attempt to balance international trade. Now granted, the U.S. was more than happy to exercise its exorbitant privilege granted from controlling the world's reserve currency, and it started spending far beyond its means. But the key here is that the discipline of the gold system was broken by the fact that currencies were devalued deliberately. What should have happened was that countries that exported more than they imported would have seen not only an influx of gold into their coffers, but also a strengthening of their currencies until the trade balance was corrected. But when currencies were devalued, it resulted in a persistent trade imbalance that could not be controlled by the flow of gold. And so, between excess U.S. government spending and the persistent attractiveness of internationally made goods, the gold flowed out of U.S. coffers and continued to do so for a long time. All because gold's honesty as it pertains to balance sheet accounting far exceeded the cap capability of mankind to be honest with one another in financial dealings. And so in 1971, we see the U.S. cheating again, when Nixon closed the gold window, ending convertibility of U.S. currency for gold. This was followed by a long string of years where the Treasury gold stock more or less remained stagnant. And it was also a long string of years where U.S. debt started to skyrocket. The U.S. currency still acted as the world reserve currency because the rest of the world wasn't prepared to institute an alternative system at the time. We still had trade imbalances due to U.S. excess spending and international governments devaluing their currencies. But what once had resulted in a draining of gold led to an increase in U.S. indebtedness. And again, what one must notice is that gold's honesty as it pertains to balance sheet accounting far exceeded the capacity of mankind to be honest with one another in financial dealings. So now, one should be asking the question, if a gold standard is reenacted, how will it be made to work? Has the nature of mankind changed to the point where our leaders will be honest enough 
to match the honesty of gold? I think the answer to this is no, and I believe that most of the members on Reagan's Gold Commission reached the same conclusion. So let's discuss a system that might work, which takes into account our leader's questionable honesty. What would happen if instead of the responsibility for balancing trade resting in the hands of government officials, it was placed into the hands of the people? Remember what I said about the role of gold in the past? When a country ran a trade surplus, it would see gold flow into its treasury. Its increased purchasing power on the international stage would tend to encourage its people to spend more on imported goods until the trade imbalance was corrected. In other words, when the equation governing balance of trade was not balanced, it would be a flow of gold that corrected it. But why would it be necessary for the government to do the importing and exporting of gold? Suppose all citizens were allowed to own gold and encouraged to treat it as a store of wealth. As a country exported more than it imported, its people would become wealthier. The people themselves could accumulate more gold, and once they were satisfied that they had enough wealth, they could then increase their level of spending, and thus correct an imbalance of trade. The gold would still flow across borders. Spending habits would still change, but the decisions would rest in the hands of the people more so than in the hands of government officials whose honesty could not possibly match the honesty of gold. Sure, there would still be paper and electronic currency, but the currency would be used as it should be for making exchanges, for extending loans, and for making investments to profit. But it would be gold that would act as the bedrock which serves as the store of wealth. Ask yourself this question. Is it better for your government to accumulate and hold gold in the name of the people as a whole? Or is it better for individual citizens to make the choice for themselves and each be responsible for their own choices and their own spending habits? I know how I would answer. I think it's no accident that so many nations started minting official gold and silver coins in the 1980s. There will come a time when the current system of world trade fails and its currency system goes with it. In the meantime, isn't it nice that the option exists to personally adopt a system of wealth that offers honesty which far exceeds the honesty of our leaders? I think so. And I think the member, members of Reagan's Gold Commission would agree.